Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of The Negotiation. I am your host, Todd Embley, and today I am thrilled to welcome Noah Fraser, the China Managing Director of the Canada-China Business Council. Noah, welcome to the show. Thanks, Todd. Like, great to be here finally oh. and uh, appreciate all the work that you guys do. It's uh, it's an honor to finally be a guest on the negotiation. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. What city are you in that we are recording you from right now? Uh, I am sitting in beautiful uh, downtown Beijing in uh, the heart of San Lituan this morning. Um, the uh, The sky is not quite as crispy blue as it was yesterday for the Second day of the Belt and Road Forum, but uh, it's uh, it's it's certainly not bad. And uh, October is always the best month of the year in the city, I think. All right. Well, we are going to be talking about that Belt and Road Forum coming up here. But first, can you tell us a little bit about your background, your career, how do you ended up in China, all that fun stuff, and then how you ended up running the CCBC's China Presence? Oh, man. Um, all right. I'll try to keep it to uh, the Coles Notes version. But um, yeah, I, I came over uh, actually right out of high school. I was looking for a place to do a gap year and teach some English, um, get out of my hometown of Ottawa for a little while. And uh, China was still uh, uh, one of the places you could come in Asia without a university degree to teach. And so I spent uh, about um, my first six months was in, uh, in Jiangsu province uh, elementary schools. And uh, I really fell for it. And I was only supposed to be gone for, uh, you know, a little under a year. And, uh, you know, three, uh, three and a half years later, 2008, I was still in Nanjing and, um, you know, looking up and realizing that uh, <laughs> I, I'd, uh, I, I'd, I'd sort of uh, taken a bit of a, a sidetrack. So um, headed back to Canada and um, went, to, went back to my hometown after so many years of not being with family and friends and did uh, my, my business degree at uh, University of Ottawa. And then um, obviously wasn't uh, wasn't quite done with Asia, and so uh, spent a year in Hong Kong uh, during my undergrad, and then uh, sort of right out of right out of school um, took whatever jobs I could find in uh, in, in China and Asia oriented um, uh, business, and so I started with an education firm where we were selling programming to primarily Japanese, but I was brought on partially to sell. Chinese uh, groups of students to come over to Canada and sort of experience small town educational experiences in Canada. And uh, I mean, it was a really, a really rewarding job. It was a very, very, it was a, it was a terrific first gig, but um, I was, uh, I was sent uh, the opportunity with the Canada China Business Council way back in 2013 or 14 and uh, spent two years in the Toronto office um, taking care of what we call the Ontario chapter. Um, and then uh, I left for the private sector, uh, joined one of our member companies. We always at the CCBC consider that to be a success when one of our uh, when when our talent leaves us for a member. Um, but then, uh, you know, the, the clause of the CCBC drew me back in and uh, I left my my medical device sales position um, about two years after after landing because the opportunity to take over the the CCBC's China operations became uh, became available. And so. My uh, my our, our our executive director Sarah in Toronto gave me a call and and uh, before I knew it I was flying to Beijing and uh, five years later the rest is history. That wouldn't be Sarah Kudelakos, would it? Yeah, yeah, Sarah Kudelakos. She's been a, a former guest, I think. She has maybe twice. Yes, uh, yeah, we know her well. She's a good friend of the show. Now, you mentioned the Belt and Road Forum. I wanted to maybe take a second and just set people up who may not know what the Belt and Road kind of aura and culture is. What, what, let me just ask you, can you describe what the Belt and Road is, where it comes from, where that um, term comes sure. from? <laughs> I can sure try. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's evolved over the last 10 years, it but has. it is a, a now, a, yeah, it is a decade old uh, Xi Jinping initiative from his earliest days as, as leader of the country. Um, it was a, a originally sort of an investment-led program to integrate Central Asia and 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 further into Eastern Europe uh, with with Greater China, and it's evolved to become today a bit more of like a geopolitical platform. And uh, while it is still investment oriented and it is still, of course, sort of logistics based and it's, um, you know, they, they talk, I mean, the Belt and the Road obviously are 
a bit metaphorical, but um, you know, it, it remains a, I would say a, a, a Central Asia, China, and and beyond focused initiative that uh, aims to provide sort of an alternative to some Western investment led initiatives. Um, you also notice that uh, the Chinese have taken other strategies to 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 pick up some of those same program elements, like for example, launching the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. Um, you know, I think the the Belt and Road Forum that's happening in Beijing today is, or this week, I should say, is um, kind of a manifestation of that of that broader you know initiative. And of course, the Belt and Road. Uh, initiative or the the one belt one road, which was formerly known as in English, the Chinese is still Idai Lu. It's still one belt run road. But in any case, it was um, you know it's it's certainly been controversial over the years. Um, there have been a number of critics that have said that it's basically just a sort of um, I guess you could say sort of a preying upon some of the lesser able countries along that belt and road that are you know facing some pretty challenging. Um, you know, repayment schedules from the Chinese financing that they receive for some of these projects. Um, there are some some attachments that come to some of those investments. And so certain countries, especially in Europe, have begun to be a bit more um, a bit more analytical and, and even some are trying to uh, exit some of those deals that they made. But um, certainly this week we saw the the um, you know, we saw about 140 countries represented at this Belt and Road Forum um, in, in Beijing. And it was a, a pretty impressive exercise in soft power, I will admit. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the forum, uh, some of your highlights, some of your takeaways and some of your experiences there. Yeah, sure. So um, obviously, I mean, uh, you, you're you're familiar with Beijing and um, I don't know if all of our listeners are, but it, it, it did harken back to some of the pre-COVID days of, you know, 2016, 17, 18, where it, we had a lot of visiting foreign dignitaries and leaders, and you'd always be facing a ton of traffic in the city. It's it's sort of started again. We have um, uh, 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 it's a bit it's a bit refreshing. It's also a bit annoying because it reminds you that this used to happen all the time, and now we're back. But uh, essentially, um, there was a CEO conference, which was a very much more business focused element of the Belt and Road Forum. On uh, day one, we had uh, I, I went to the thematic forum and watched a number of. A number of speeches from a few foreign leaders, including and 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 domestic leaders, including Vice Premier Huli Fang. Uh, so so they certainly threw a lot of their political horsepower at this, as well as uh, signing of three hundred MOUs that represented um, tens of billions of dollars in investment between companies along the Belt and Road and with uh, with Chinese partners. And so it was certainly no slouch in terms of those deals, whether they come to fruition or not. I mean, obviously, becomes a, it, it is always a challenge with MOUs, right? But that was day one. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, the the roads were all closed. You know, we were shuttled around in these highly secure buses. The uh, registration process begun probably two years, ago, uh, two week, uh, excuse me, two months ago. And um, you know, we're, we're it's all very official. It's all it was all quite impressively executed. I must admit. Um, day two, even more so, because the opening ceremony um, of the Belt and Road Forum, which is sort of a plenary session where there's just a number of speeches. Is, uh, is held at the Great Hall of the People in Tiananmen Square, which is quite an incredible building, um, very historic by, by modern Chinese standards. And the, uh, the number of, of leaders and foreign dignitaries that were thrown at this thing was, was also pretty, pretty incredible. Um, you know, the roster of speakers in the morning was, uh, you know, begun with, uh, with President Xi, which is a rare occasion to see him in public, um, especially in an event as large as this. He, uh, he was followed by none other than President Vladimir Putin, um, the uh, the leaders of Kazakhstan, Ethiopia, Argentina were uh, were also offered the opportunity to make some remarks, and um, of course the uh, the UN Secretary General as well. And so uh, it was a pretty a pretty wild ride in terms of seeing a, a number of of you know global global leaders that are. Uh, some of whom are not really welcome anywhere else, <laughs> including Mr. Putin, who is uh, probably mm -hmm. one of his first trips outside of Russia since uh, since the invasion of Ukraine a few months ago or a few years ago. Um, I guess I should rephrase that, Todd. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the invasion of Ukraine was only about a year ago now, I suppose, but uh, it was not yeah. mentioned anywhere in the uh, in the in the speeches. Um, you know, I think that there were a couple of 
reflections upon conflict and uh, multipolarism in the world today, but uh, certainly a, a very a, a very big to do. Um, you know, I've never seen so much media in one place in Beijing in the last five years. I've never seen so many foreign faces in Beijing in the last four or five years. Um, a really uh, incredible. Um, you know, effort on the part of the Chinese to get this uh, to get this thing in place, and uh, always an amazing show when you get to go to the Great Hall of the People and see uh, and see this type of thing in action. And so, certainly, I, a, a few reflections, and um, you know, a, an interesting morning, no doubt. But uh, hard to say how much value there really is to take out of it. I think the Chinese announced a number of major financial commitments, like three hundred and fifty billion dollar financing window through the Exim Bank and a couple of other pretty big activities. And so uh, China is definitely flexing its muscles and uh, trying to step in where it feels that the West has stepped away from that globalization and that multipolar world order. Yeah, for those who have never been able to attend, let's call it a show in China. Nobody does it like they do, whether it's the Olympics, or it's summer Davos, or it's, uh, you know, a conference, a tech conference, what have you. It is on a scale, um, you 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 just have to witness and be a part of yourself. I mean, um, it's it's ab absolutely incredible. I've been to Web Summit, you know, in Lisbon a couple of times, one of the biggest tech conference in the world. Um, man, I'm telling you, it it pales in comparison to this type of things that that China can pull off. It's it's absolutely incredible. So, uh, for anybody listening who wants to go and and just see something on epic proportion. That's where you want to go see something, <laughs> let me tell you. Now, let's uh, transition over to the CCBC. Um, annual general meeting, your AGM is coming up. I think there's something special about this one, perhaps. It's coming up at the end of the month. Why don't you tee that up for us and maybe talk to us a little bit about what's going to make this year's AGM so special? Yeah, well, I, I, can't, um, I can't tell you how excited I am um, for this particular AGM, Todd. It's really... It's really coming together. Um, we've got a number of of people coming over from Canada that are uh, we we. I guess I should backtrack a bit. You know, my uh, I, I've been running the China operations of the CCBC since the beginning of COVID, and actually a couple of years before that. But um, you know, our our annual general meeting is 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 sort of the flagship Canada China business event of the year, and we traditionally hold it in China. It's uh, almost always in Beijing. It's a real opportunity for our members uh, across uh, Canadian companies to build uh, a couple of weeks worth of meetings around. It's an anchor program for a lot of people. We get a lot of uh, Chinese uh, involvement from senior leadership over here. And so it's a real, a, a really strong platform for a lot of Canadian firms to base a, a good China trip around. Um, and, you know, for the last three years, we haven't been able to do that. It's uh, it, travel in and out of China has essentially been impossible. Um, you know, I think that w w the last two AGMs, we've not had a single individual come over from Canada to to join the proceedings. And so the event has changed and it's ha had changed in its nature a little bit to be a much more locally focused event. And of course, as you know, the uh, there was a bit of an exodus of expats, especially Canadians, over the last several years mm -hmm. uh, out of out mm -hmm. of Greater China and Beijing in particular as well. And so, we had a very um, a very local room for the last couple of years, where our our uh, you know the, the, the most senior uh, Canadian executive or or leader that we would normally get would be the ambassador. Um, of course, we had Dominic Barton for a couple of years, which was certainly no slouch, and he always brought the show uh, or brought the room down, but. Um, you know, I think this year we're we're finally um, we're approaching. I would say we're not quite there, but we're approaching where we were, say, in 2018 at the at the height of um, I would say like the the golden years of, of Canada China relations in the mid teens. Um, you know, that year we had uh, the Minister of Finance, we had um, we had uh, former Prime Minister Chrétien, we had uh, a number of uh, elected officials from Canada that came over. Uh, Dozens of Canadian companies, of course, in the room, and um, this year we're, we're we're not quite there there, but we are very excited with the with the turnout. We have three concurrent delegations that are coming over: so education, Indigenous business leaders, and women in business. Um, so we'll have forty or fifty uh, business delegates that are coming over. They all have um, they all have individual and unique programs, and uh, a great opportunity for them to 
reflect and review um, their Chinese relationships and get you know get back in touch with their connections here. Um, we have uh, almost our entire board who finally is getting back over. So we're talking about executives at decision making levels from some of Canada's largest companies across the financial sector, natural resources, uh, et cetera. A really good, um, a really good contingent of folks from the business community, and then of course uh, uh, several CEOs from Canada's largest companies that are accompanying um, no, none other than than former Prime Minister Jean Chrétien as well. And so we've got a a pretty solid uh, uh, roster of Canadians that are rounding out the the people coming over, and we're looking forward to uh, some more senior engagement from Chinese leaders as well. Um, and of course, uh, you know, it'll be it'll be a, a a much bigger and busier room than we've had in the last couple of years. You know, we're looking at probably 350 or so people as opposed to about 220 in years before. And so that's a good indicator of how many people from Canada usually come over. Um, you know, this is our 45th AGM. And uh, I did this event yesterday. The Belt and Road Forum opening was at the Great Hall of the People. We actually hosted the uh, CCBC AGM at the Great Hall of the People a couple of times way back in the day. Um, it's uh, it's it's shifted in size and scope on, uh, and and evolved over the years. We also have um, so in addition to a, a business dinner that we host on the evening of the thirty first, the morning is occupied by three kind of heavy hitting panel discussions: um, one on natural resources, one on agri food and agri tech, and one on uh, consumer goods and the consumer economy in China. And I think um, you know we're looking forward to you know really robust conversations as well. And so it's a it's it's a great opp opportunity for for Canada and China to have a bit of a a reset, I think, um, in terms of our business relationship. There are a number of challenges that we hope to address, and also, uh, as I said, a great opportunity for some some Canadian business leaders to get back over to China after a long gap. Well, no pressure, Noah. Uh, you've got a big uh, you've, <laughs> you've got a big show uh, that you need to put on. Um, I know it's exciting and. And potentially nerve wracking at the same time, um, but probably mostly exciting. Uh, and you've been around a long time and you're going to do well. Uh, may I ask, what is the main on the menu for that big dinner? I wish I is could say Peking it was Canadian duck? beef. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that would have been an beef. appropriate appetizer, perhaps. Yeah. If only it yeah. was, uh, if only if it was Alberta beef or, um, or Halifax uh, or Nova Scotia seafood. Um, yeah. You know, Alabama. sadly, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Unfortunately, it's um, uh, the reason I bring up beef is that we've got a uh, we've got some some market access challenges in that segment, and so um, difficult to get your hands on it in China these days. Uh, we will mm. have Canadian wines, however, so uh, mm. some some fruit on the menu in from Canada at least. Yeah, well, I'm uh, gonna give a shout out to my Okanagan region here. We are pretty well known for our wine over on this side. I mean. <laughs> You know, I, mean, I I know that Ontario's got a bit of a stranglehold on it, but we do we, we do pretty well over here in the Okanagan as well, out here in BC. Um, now we've had Michael Hart from Amcham China on recently. Uh, recently, we've had Sarah Kudulakos, as you know, on a while back. We've had a lot of guests that are a part of, familiar with, or have roles in business chambers or with the CCBC. But can you maybe take us back and, and up uh, to a high level a little bit to introduce the CCBC to people who might not be familiar, maybe paint a picture of the membership and tell us about the important work that the, that the, the council does. Sure. Yeah, no, happy to. Um, again, I'll try to keep it brief. We're, uh, we're, we're uh, small but mighty. Um, we, were, we were founded in 1978, so 45 years of history, as I mentioned. Um, with uh, former Prime Minister Trudeau and a number of business leaders flying over to China right at the beginning of reform and opening, seeing the opportunity down the road and deciding to start investing in that from a business and political perspective early. And so uh, we've got uh, now we've grown to uh, seven offices, five in Canada across the major cities and two here in China that I take care of in Beijing and Shanghai. Um, we sit at roughly 250 to 300 members on a year to year basis. You know, there's always some, some that come and go, some that graduate and some that join. Um, but a core group of a couple of hundred that have, that have been very loyal with us for, for, for many, many years and some, some for many decades now, uh, including our founding members. And so, uh, we're, we're well supported. We're, we are a, a foreign NGO here in China. And so a, a unique, um, a unique kind of set of challenges with that. But, uh, you know, essentially what we do is that we're the we're the de facto chamber of commerce between Canada and China. Right. We have um, 
We have a number of business services that we offer, including human resources, rental, uh, consulting, report writing, this type of thing, analysis and insights. We have, um, of course, our, our membership bucket, which includes, as I said, 300, or 250 or 300 of Canada's most active Canada-China oriented firms across, we identify 27 sectors. So um, they range from financial services all the way down to SMEs that are that are you know starting off in their garage, and so uh, a, a really unique group um, across across a number of different initiatives that are that all have their own special China needs and challenges. Um, and then uh, beyond that, we do some major events. So we were talking about the AGM; that's our annual flagship. There's no doubt about that. But we have a, a number of really amazing initiatives that we offer over the course of the year. I think we do no 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 less than a hundred events a year. Um, in all of our, our Canadian cities, including seminars on recent China policy or over here in China, we have our annual uh, Canada Day um, garden party. We have a number of uh, interesting initiatives where we're engaging alumni. We, um, we, we have a two a year where we in Shanghai and Beijing, we bring together 350 or 400 uh, graduates of Canadian universities that have returned to China and are looking to reconnect with their Canadian roots. And uh, and so we're building a, a really impressive, um, you know, a Rolodex of, of of former Canadians, so to speak, that have come back, and uh, and and so we're, we continue to be very active in that space. And uh, and then of course here in Beijing, we we also operate as the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, and so we do a lot of social and on the ground activities to engage the Canadian community, which, as I'd mentioned, is unfortunately dwindled uh, a, a great deal. There are fewer and fewer. Canadian expatriates on the ground here in China and Beijing in particular. And so that's that's been a difficult part of the, the role for the last couple of years. But it remains a, a real priority for us to ensure that the Canadians on the ground here are are engaged and are uh, feeling connected. And, um, you know, all that that rounds out to to, you know, uh, this this 45 years of, of serving Canadian and uh, and Chinese firms as well. We are a bilateral chamber of commerce where we have Chinese firms that we assist in Canada on a number of levels. And, um, you know, the going has not been easy for Chinese companies in Canada either. And so they've required a lot of help. And we have a really strong team in uh, in, in our five offices in Canada. And so, of course, you, you can guess those are in Vancouver, Calgary, uh, Toronto, Montreal and Halifax. And uh, a, a really a, a really terrific team. And obviously, COVID has been a unique opportunity for us to geographically reintegrate um, on an electronic level, we we rarely saw each other formally, and now we have. Uh, we, we I, I think that the silver lining of the pandemic was that the CCBC has probably never been better integrated across our, our many offices, and so uh, all in all, um, a, a really, uh, um, I guess you could say, a very uh, as I said, small but mighty organization. We're we run on a very relatively sh- small budget, and where we are a not for profit business association, and so. Uh, we're very, very appreciative of long-term members, including WPIC Marketing and Technologies, of course, who's uh, who's been with us on, on uh, through thick and thin since uh, I think even 2012 or 2013 when the Cook Brothers joined, and we've worked on a number of really cool initiatives with uh, with you guys, and so it's great to be a part of that too. Yeah, I mean, it's the challenging times where are when the CCB CCBC is probably needed the most, right? And I and I would point this out to a lot of companies too, is that the, the challenging, time, challenging times are where the real opportunities lie as well. So I think there is um, good times ahead. All we needed to see was the door start to crack open a little bit. And now we're starting to see even with the Belt and Road Forum and all the, all the people coming to that, all the people coming to your AGM. I think it, it now is the time for the bold and the brave. If they want to be successful, those are going to be the ones that are going to be striking first and looking to get on board here. So I think that's really cool. Um, I've always wondered if the CCBC almost couldn't have a hockey tournament. Uh, maybe a maybe a Dashan Cup um, would be kind of cool up in <laughs> Beijing. <clears throat> I've always thought that would be kind of a fun thing to do. But anyway, I digress. Let's get a little bit gritty. Uh, what is your overall assessment of the current business environment in China? Well, a uh, gritty question indeed. I, I think it depends who you ask, right? Um, a lot of our members have had tremendous success over the past several years uh, with or without the the challenging policy environment. And uh, of course, the COVID zero, the, the COVID zero, you know, regime that was imposed upon us these last several years. Um, 
sectorally, you know, you've got a number of, uh, of companies that are facing real challenges, uh, pork and beef, of course, um, pet food, uh, certain natural resources firms like canola, where we're, we're, we're facing a number of challenges over the last several years. Some have come to a degree of resolution, others not. Um, and then, of course, you know, there are just the market fundamentals that have changed a little bit here, too, right? It is um, the economy, I think, is still extremely worth investing in. But by some measures and depending on the size of your company, then, you know, there is there is a degree of, of slowdown here as well. And that's affected that's affected consumer confidence. That's affected um, business confidence in terms of reinvestment. Um, you know, overall, the environment uh, we we across the the chambers of commerce here, you mentioned Michael and um, you know, all of the other, we have, we have a group here, we call the B8, uh, the business eight. And so these are the, uh, you know, eight like-minded uh, company or countries, excuse me, that have chambers of commerce that all operate here together. And we, uh, we get together for a meeting in the minds quarterly. And we always find that we all have the same complaints, you know? Um, and so we've regularly advocated for uh, a number of updates and changes to the policy environment, some of which have been have been met with, uh, with, you know, I think open ears on the Chinese part, and we have had a number of successes. And then others, um, you know, the environment has remained stubbornly challenging. Uh, so again, I think it, it, it does come back to who you ask. Um, I know that WPIC has had a couple of terrific years, and then other companies and other sectors have almost been at the point where they've had to pull out of the market because their policy challenges are too great and they, uh, and they can't continue to operate. Um, so, so again, I think it's, uh, it depends if you're, if you're able to thread the needle, you know, if you're able to be a little bit, um, a bit, a bit, maybe more, um, savvy on how you enter the market, how you operate here, the niche that you find for yourself. Um, it's not, uh, it's not 2008 anymore. It's not 2015 anymore. It's not even 2018 anymore, right? China has really evolved, really changed. It is still an incredible market opportunity, I believe, but you can't just um, you know walk in and expect uh, doors to be open for you necessarily. You can't you can't expect a um, you know an easy ride. Not that you ever could, but I think that um, parts of parts of the China market have become certainly more um, more more business friendly. I think uh, you know, for example, intellectual property protection has increased a lot. Um, you know, you've got you've you've got a number of wins in that space. Uh, however, you know, there have been other areas that have maybe pulled back. And I think that internationalization and making, um, you know, a, a friendly business environment for expatriates, for companies to send people over here, you know, the company, the, the country has become in many ways less international um, as it, as it says that it wants to be more international. And so uh, again, I think it comes back to, it, it is subjective, but um, you know, that's, that's what, that's what companies like, like CCBC and, and Whippick are here for to consult on that. Right. And to help people navigate this, uh, this evolving space. That's right. I mean, that that is a key. It's a running theme in the podcast that we always talk about. Use the available Sherpas that are out there, like the CCBC, like WPIC. Why wouldn't you? Right. It's it's just it's it's the help. It's the navigation um, that is is really going to you know take a load off of, of the difficulty and the complexities and just kind of help give you at least a map of, of where to go and how to do things over there now. On a positive note, let's just start talking about some of the sectors that you're a fan of, that you see some really great opportunities for Canadian companies to exist and grow in China right now. Oh, man, Todd, there's so many. There's so many. I think that the Canadian and Chinese economies are still so complementary. You know, I think that we've got a difficult policy environment. We've had some market access challenges, but ultimately what is needed over here and what we excel in in Canada is really, it, 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 they're really puzzle pieces and um, they click together so well. So I think agri-food, agri-tech, there's a, a tremendous, tremendous opportunity there for Canadian growers, farmers, even, um, you know, uh, downstream production, finished goods. I think like, you know, some of our, some of our food exports are really, really popular over here. Nutraceuticals, I think is amazing space. Um, you know, as far as, other Canadian, other Canadian opportunities, or, or uh, you know, I should say Canadian, Canadian um, exceptionalism, uh, definitely comes in natural resources, our uh, our commodities, our high end goods like in um, in lumber, in um, in in our uh, rare earths, and in metals and mining. I think we still have an incredible space here. China is still going to be the 
the key market for those things to continue. Um, you know, beyond that, financial services, really, I think that Canada has such an opportunity here. We, we, um, we, we do have a difficult policy environment in that space, but China continues to indicate that they're liberalizing. And uh, I know a lot of our companies in our membership in that space would like to do more in RNB, would like to do more in, 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 uh, in their, their various kind of financial vehicles. But um, I think that they're also some of the most committed companies in that space. And being here and having boots on the ground and investing on the long term has always paid off or seems to continue to pay off in that space. And so, yeah, I think those are those are a number of, of really strong opportunities for Canadian firms. And, you know, I come back to it, but um, the media tends to portray a, a, a real slack in the consumer market here in China. I mean, the 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 trouble with that is that the um, the statistics are 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 cumulative. Right. And you've got um, <laughs> you've got a market here that may be going through a, a relative valley as opposed to a peak, but you've still got the largest middle-class consumer market on the planet, and you are still going to grow your brands faster here than anywhere else if you get the right partners. And so you could look at companies like uh, Arcteryx or Canada Goose and Lululemon that have, uh, that have just excelled here in the consumer space. Um, you know, they, they're, it's not without its challenges, but these are, these are companies that see growth here more than they see it anywhere else in the world. And, um, you know, we come back to Tim Hortons, right? Where uh, they, they were smart, they they um, they received uh, or they they partnered closely with a Chinese private equity company, uh, global private equity partners, to to create sort of um, a really really strong um, uh, partnership where they could freely and openly invest in the market in the brand. They are leaning into Brand Canada in um, in an amazing way, and there are Tim Hortons coffee shops springing up all over the country. I think they're up to a couple of thousand now across China. It's just incredible how fast they've grown. And, um, and the market responds when they localize, when they have, uh, you know, Chinese tastes on their menu, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're really, they're really doing a lot here. And again, I think that they, they were, there were companies that have failed in that space. And uh, they, they didn't localize and they didn't take on some of the strategies that companies like Arcteryx or Tim's or Canada Goose have, have managed. And so, there's a way to navigate it. There's a way to to excel. I think consumer the consumer market is still extremely investable here, and um, anybody that's not looking at it or at least developing a strategy, uh, if they're in that sector, is uh, is is crazy not to be not to be developing that that thinking. Listen, China knows what they have, and they're not just going to let anybody walk into their house and go to their fridge and dig out their 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 most expensive prime rib and and cook it up sit down and eat it i mean they, it's it you can't go into china thinking you're going to be an incumbent and you certainly can't blame china for wanting to make sure that some of their homegrown companies and the economics um and the revenues are are gonna are gonna facilitate and be there for their own first and to get a strong foothold and to make sure that they're taken care of. And then, yes, they might liberalize as they go forward, but they're going to protect and take care of their own first and who wouldn't and who could possibly blame them for it. But there's just still so many opportunities. And for those who are balking at the opportunity in China, because that inflection, that growth curve isn't literally going straight up asymptotically, that's ridiculous. Um, it is it is still going up into the right at a healthy grade, and that is still providing a better opportunity that you're going to find just about anywhere else around the world. Um, I would encourage people in their own country to look at their own growth curves and then still go look at China's and then you tell me where you'd want to be. So I digress. What are some of the key policy and government engagement priorities that you and the CCBC work on and try to further? That's an excellent point. I mean, I, I couldn't agree with what you said more. Um, you know, the uh, the critics of that would say that, you know, China should be more open and more globalized and more internationalized. And uh, unfortunately, those are people that haven't been watching for the last 45 years because they've been playing mm -hmm. the same 
they've been playing the same strategy since since the beginning. Um, you know what? What do we, and, and and that actually is a good segue into what we what we fight for on this end. Um, one of our I would say major policy wins in the last couple of years was we had um, we had a number of consultations with uh, both local in Beijing and central government uh, players to do our best to get the um, tax code adjusted to ensure that expatriates would continue to be able to live, um, I guess you could say profitably in China. Mm -hmm. um, there were some there were some challenging updates to the tax code that were coming here that were going to affect expats very, very negatively. And we were able to go to bat and 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 alongside some of the other chambers of commerce um, really, really get the get a, a very favorable results for um, for for our members that still have expats here. Unfortunately, it may have come a little too little too late. Unfortunately, because so many people have decided to move on um, from China, but it's certainly still a, 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 a very easy place to live and work in many ways. Um, you know, beyond that, on a regular basis, we're constantly fighting for um, financial liberalization, market opening. You know, these are these are areas where China has moved. They have they have increased. They've always noted that they're going that direction. It just doesn't necessarily happen as fast as we'd like it to. And then um, a big part of what we do in the last several years since we've had these uh, geopolitical challenges between Canada and China, the tensions since the, uh, you know, the Mon and Michaels issue came to a head, um, you know, has been has been ensuring that market access is apolitical and that the sectors that we work with and represent are not being uh, exposed to market entry or market access challenges for their goods if the um, if the reasons are not kind of fact and science based, you know, we um, we do believe there are a number of products that are still unable to enter China freely um, because of some politically motivated uh, tensions and challenges. Um, obviously, we do a lot of that advocacy work here in Beijing. Um, some of it also, of course, happens in Ottawa, um, where, where we have close relationships with the embassy there. And, uh, and you know, I think that over time we've we've been able to chip away. Um, but you know, it, I, it's hard to under, it's hard to understate the, um, or excuse me, it's hard to overstate the, uh, the the level of challenge that the Canada-China business relationship has faced in the last several years. Um, very few companies have come out unscathed, and um, we're, you know, we're we're hoping that we can put those those difficult years behind us as soon as possible. But uh, you know, I think that everybody has to come to the table with an open mind, and uh, it's it's going to be a, a long slog in terms of um, of building up that trust again. So uh, you know, it's a it's 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 a, a a charm offensive required sometimes. Um, but you know, the the economics uh, on this end are also, I would say, very open to to reintegration with Canada. We have a number of. Uh, I would say, you know, uh, local, regional, provincial uh, bodies like the CCPIT and the local uh, economic development bureaus that have really come out of the woodwork in the last year or so, um, you know, coming to the CCBC for, um, you know, requests for access to Canada, for business delegations to go back and forth. They're looking to invest, looking to attract new investment, greenfield, brownfield investment. They're very keen to meet the KPIs that they've been assigned by central government. And uh, it, it is, um, you know, they, they are facing a lot of challenges outside of the, the, the East Coast and outside of the big kind of tier one cities here. And so uh, they're, they're very keen to engage the foreign business community. And I think that some of those policy challenges that you may face or you may have faced previously would be um, would be a little bit more liberal uh, if you were willing to go into some of those areas. So it's a uh, that's another conversation, but certainly um a trend that we've seen emerge over the last several months, no doubt. Okay. I want to get your take on the FDI landscape over there. I know that you regularly travel around China. You meet with a lot of officials in a lot of different areas. What has your reception been like lately? Are governments, are officials eager? What is their appetite for attracting FDI or foreign direct investment? And is now a good time, in your opinion, for to be investing in China. Yeah, well, I mean, I, as I as I said, Todd, I really think that now is now is is a good time. This is and, and you mentioned it yourself, you know, in in a, in a period of a time when there's a vacuum or where there's political tension or I mean, there, there are people that can be very strategic and that can enter the market and actually find a ton of success in those in those empty spaces. I mean, as you said, I, I, I go all over the country and I meet with um, 
economic development bureaus. I meet with CCPIT. I meet with uh, local officials, including party secretaries and mayors of various cities and towns. And I got to say, there's a, a really strong appetite for new investment. They are they're rolling out all the stops um, or pulling out all the stops, I should say. Um, you know, you mentioned that nobody does a show like China. I mean, you can go to tier three, tier four cities that are putting on enormous investment conferences and, in, and inviting people from all over the country to show up and show off their their um, their the, you know their their liberal or free policy landscape and how friendly they are to business. They are they're very hungry for FDI right now. And I think, as I said earlier, there is a a pretty pretty intense number of KPIs and 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 quotas that are that are put on these uh, local officials from the central government level that um, they're they're very motivated to meet and. Uh, it's it's a difficult it's a difficult space for them. Um, you know, obviously China has not, on a broader kind of, I guess you could say macro geopolitical level globally, has not done itself a whole lot of favors in terms of making itself look to be an attractive investment environment. Um, but I think that you know a lot of a lot of things in, in the in the world of business in China happen very locally, right? And it's important not to focus on a very high level headline when um, you've got very strong relationships in a given in a given district or city, you know, I think it's still um, companies need to be very aware and very wary that um, officials do move on just because, you know, the mayor of Nanjing today, he won't be the mayor of Nanjing or she won't be the mayor of Nanjing in, in three or four years time. Right. People do move on. And so, you know, there are certainly areas where you've got to be constantly building your government relations toolkit. You've constantly got to be investing and manicuring in your relationships here. That's a really big part of it. Having local boots on the ground could not be more important in this country. Uh, doing certain things in language is just the only way to get things done here. Um, you know, at CCBC, I'm, I'm the only Canadian expat on our team and really I'm the only one we need. It's, uh, you know, a, a tremendous amount of our GR and our, our integration in, in China happens at a local level with some of the fabulous staff that we have over here on the ground. And so I highly recommend companies do the same in that space. But we are here for uh, for help and for consultation. And uh, I think that the environment is is welcoming, but it will depend on where you go, who you talk to, what sector you're in. And uh, as I said, threading that needle is, is important before you make uh, very significant investments. You know, I said it before, China knows what they have. And from my time in China, I felt that they also had a little bit of a resentment in that they felt maybe in the past they'd been a little bit taken advantage of. They were the manufacturing hub of the world. And I think they're not going to be looking favorably upon entities or investors who are trying to take advantage of the economy, of the GDP, of the consumer, the, just the amount of consumers, what have you. I think they want to know that you're going to come and be a part of the growth, be a part of the solution. You're going to invest, as you said, boots on the ground. They want to know that you're here, that you're here for the long haul and that you're you're, you're going to be a partner, not somebody who's just going to take advantage, who's going to come and going to go and going to take and then leave. Um, they want to know that you're going to stick around um, and that you're in it for the long haul. So um, that's just a little FYI or a little bit of preaching on my part to companies that are going over there. This is the thing. And and on the other aspect of of kind of the climate over there, anybody in real estate will tell you. You want to sell in the summer, but you want to buy in the winter. And I think if we're looking at a, at a business climate, it's winter. Well, now, that, now is when you want to buy. And, and if it's wide open and the grass is green and the sun is out, the amount of competition you're going to have, you're, you're going to lose the advantage far more than you're going to gain in it being a little bit easier or it being a little bit sunnier um, on the bottom line. So anyway. That's what we're preaching. That's what I'm preaching. I don't want to put words in your mouth. These are all coming from me. And coming from <laughs> me is another question around Canada's engagement with China. It's been a little bit up for debate as a domestic political issue. So why does the CCBC support economic engagement? And what's the message CCBC is delivering in Ottawa? Well, it's a, 
you know, no doubt there's there's some some very significant tensions, and and there is a reason for that. You know, um, we think that there has certainly been been a great deal of uh, unnecessary ratcheting. There's been some very very strong language coming out of both sides. Um, you know, we're 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 still we're still at the nadir, I think, of of our of our relationship. We've got a long way to go. Um, you know, I think that our message has always been that um, you know Canada is a incredibly strong source of food natural resources and it's a and 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 other consumer goods that the chinese consumer economy is very much attracted to and if it contributes to the health wealth and prosperity of canadians we're in support um you know generally speaking i think that the canadian economy is not very well diversified you know it's uh we are we are very much in the in the you know, in the hands of the American market, which is, a, is, is, is actually wonderful, right? It's we're, we're very, we're very blessed in many ways to have that trading partner. And, uh, and I think that we're, you know, we should not certainly shy away from it or, or, or move away from the U S at the, at the, you know, at the cost of something else. It's uh it's just a matter of having this alternative trading partner that I think that we need to be better. Um, you know, we need to be better educated on, we need to understand the opportunity. We need to understand the challenges we need to be clear eyed. I think, um, you know, that's really the message for us is not um, blindly enter China and, you know, jump in with both feet. It's it's be aware of this of this of this incredible opportunity. Be aware that it is not uh, without its pitfalls. And um, but 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 have a China strategy, because if if even if your China strategy is no China, then, you know, you're you're at least you're, you've done your research, you've done your homework and you know what you're doing and what, it, and that it's not for you. Um, but I think that there are so many Canadian firms and there are so many Canadians independently, like we've done a lot of research that shows it. There are, there are a lot of people that wake up every day and are employed because of our relationship with China. Uh, and there are a lot more people that could be as we, as we develop certain segments of the market. And, you know, to be blind to that is, is, you know, this is unfortunate. And uh, it, it's, China does not have to be, you know, the enemy that 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 many media headlines make it out to be. Um, it is it is complex. It is multifaceted. It is a much more um, a, a much more multi layered relationship than the one that we have with the U.S. Of course, and um, it's it's got its its long term question marks, of course, too. Right. Uh, however, you know, as I said, understanding, localizing, building up your competencies. This these are not they're not things that are going to cost. Um, they're going to they're they're going to be areas of profit down the road, and so we hope that certain areas of the Canadian economy will still continue to be able to benefit from the relationship with China at uh, you know for the for the future growth of all Canadians. You bet. Okay, let's talk a little bit fun stuff. Uh, you are what we hear is a new captain in the Beijing International Ice Hockey League. <laughs> Tell us about the league and, and how are the beloved Beijing Bulls doing this season? Oh my God, what can I say? Um, <laughs> you know, we're 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 a work in progress, but we're uh, we're chalking up a couple of wins. We're two and two on the season. I mean, what can I say? The Beijing International nice. Ice Hockey League is like one of the one of the uh, the shining lights of uh, of the expatriate scene in in the city here. It's so much fun. We've got such a diverse group of people from all over the world that are playing. I mean, it's got to be 50% local, about 30 or 40% Canadians, and then the rest is a mix of Finns and uh, Americans and all kinds of folks from all over the world that, uh, that, are, that are, you know, we're just looking for a social outlet on Sunday nights. And I got to say, it's very well organized where I didn't know how much of a, a time commitment being a captain was going to be, including drafting a team and, uh, you know, attending meetings and setting up rules and all kinds of stuff. We're... we're it's a lot of fun. It's, uh, you know, I think it's fun first hockey second. Um, and, and, you know, we're, we have a great time. It's, it's an amazing product too. Every time, um, somebody comes out to a game of, from my, my friend community, they always say like, this is amazing. You guys should be advertising these games. You should be selling tickets to these games. Um, because the, the quality of the, uh, of the hockey on the ice is actually pretty good. We've got a couple of guys that were certainly NHL caliber, um, in the league. And then there are other guys that are just lacing up their skates for the first time in 20 years. And, we have a really inclusive environment for them there. And, and, you know, I encourage anybody that's listening, that's based in Beijing, that, uh, that has any degree of, of hockey interest or skill, get in touch with us. And, uh, it'd be a lot of fun to have you out and even just to watch, uh, we, we always need more, 
we always need more Bulls fans in the stands. All right. That's awesome. And we look forward to uh, a dash on cop uh, at some point, uh, you know, sponsored by the CCBC. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to keep just saying it. I feel like if I just prophesy, just just keep manifesting this to happen. I'll just say it on future a- episodes more and more. And and who knows, maybe one day we'll, we'll see that. But anyway, Noah Fraser, China Managing Director of the Canada China Business Council. Thank you very, very much for coming on the show. Thanks, Todd. My pleasure. Come back anytime. All right. Okay, so for everybody, uh, just a reminder that we are on all your podcast platforms if you like to absorb what we say and do here, uh, audio only. And for those of you who want to see some video and get some snippets and love their YouTube shorts, head over to the WPIC YouTube channel and you can find it all over there. But for Noah and for myself and everybody at the negotiation team who brings this to you every week, thanks very much for listening and we'll see you next time.